Good morning. It's great to see you all here this morning. Welcome to uh, Trinity Church. I just want to point out in your uh, worship folder is a card called the response card. And it's anything that kind of God stirs in you and you need to respond, you just write that down, a prayer request, a praise. You want one of these fancy name tags that you give out for free. Just put down your name legibly and mark name tag and then I'll show up uh, next week. It is our privilege uh, to serve you. I'd like to start today out um, uh, with a quote by one of our great philosophers, Madonna. <laughs> she uh, writes... Some boys kiss me, some boys hug me, I think they're okay. I, if they don't give me proper credit, I just walk away. They can beg and they can plead, but if they can't see the light, that's right, because the boy with the cold hard cash is always Mr. Right. Because we are, she goes on saying, Living in a material world, and I am a material girl. You know <laughs> that we are living in a material world, and I am a material girl. Uh, that uh, song, the spirit of that song, which came out kind of in the spirit of the 80s, really um, kind of, you know, it, it's lighthearted, it's, it's fun, um, but it but in essence, it also kind of is right. We live in a material world. I, I, I don't have to, I have to preach on this. <coughs> you know, you live in the Bay Area. You, you, you know how it's a material. But, but the truth is, 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 even all across the world, even in, even in non-Western societies where they don't have a whole lot, there is a desire and there is a focus for material things. Um, however, the, the, the challenge with the material world is its temporalness, the futility of it. And, and, you know, there's so many ways I could talk about this. So, but I was just thinking the thing that makes it clearer in my life is throughout my life, there have been um, certain things that I've owned that at the time, I was all that and then some because I had it. So you might remember, some of you might recognize this picture right here. <laughs> For some of you younger folks, that is called a pager. Now, let me tell you about this amazing invention, the pager. I, I had this. Uh, um, it was most common with doctors and, and lawyers. I mean, people that were really important. I, I served at a group home, and sometimes you were needed in case of emergency. And so what someone could do, I know this is going to blow your mind. Someone would pick up a phone, with, usually with a cord, and um, they would call my uh, number, and if I didn't answer, they had the ability to leave their number. And then magically, this little box on my belt would vibrate, and I'd pick it up, and it would tell me the number that called me. Yeah. And then I had to go find one of those corded phones and call the number back. At the time, uh, it was a big deal. I was very proud. That's when I tucked my shirt in so everyone could see my pager that I was wearing. <laughs> uh, now, you know, pagers began to kind of find the wayside after a while. As a matter of fact, you, you could get one for pretty much for free now. I think they're, they're, uh, they're not even, they don't even rate in the, you know, the antique store. But um, I moved on from the pager to a PDA. Now, you couldn't make phone calls on these. But the cool thing is, is it was electronic, and I could, I could put all my appointments in, in my uh, a thing, and I could, I, could make, I could make notes and kind of stuff. I could keep my calendar. I, I, it was pretty good. While everybody else, they had this, this thing called a notebook. And they, they actually had to take a pen and write. If you made a mistake, you couldn't just backspace. You actually had to cross it out. But not me, because I had this PDA. So if, if, if something changed, I could backspace and, and make a change. And then I could even, um, there was a cord I could plug in to this huge box uh, they called a computer. And, um, um, and it would sync up. I, it would be on the computer as well. And that was a big, big deal. 
uh, at, at the time. I, I was very, very proud. And then, of course, um, the, my first cell phone was a Razor. Now, I don't know if you guys remember, but this was the hip phone, okay? This was the hip phone. Not only was it the thinnest phone that you could get at the time, but here's the amazing part. That, that little screen on top there, when the phone was closed, you could see the time <laughs> and the person calling. Everybody else had to open up their phone and say hello and find out. But if you had a razor, you could just look at your phone and it was there. Wow. Yeah. Again, maybe not even the antique store. And then, of course, I, was, I, I wasn't one of the first, but I moved to the iPhone. This is the original iPhone. I had one of the first generation. Now, I'm never, the truth is, I was never, ever cutting edge. In other words, I never stood in line. I never got it year one. I'm always year two, three behind um, uh, everything. But, when I, but I was one of the first folks to get an iPhone and, and use all the apps and whatnot. The interesting thing is my, my kids had, uh, have flip phones, which they thought were dinosaurs for the longest time. And they were. Um, and I offered them my iPhone, and they, every single one of them turned me down um, because of what it can't do. And uh, so I finally upgraded to the iPhone 5S. Five, and now when I got this, again, I was about a year behind. Um, I always wait for the next generation to come out because then the, it's cheaper. I, that's just the way I am. All right? I come by it honestly. Anyhow. Um, and so I have a five. And again, it, in the day and the time, it was all that. But of course, you know, this is an old phone for old people, for unhip people right now. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I have a, a, a drawer at home that has all these things in it. <laughs> I have my pager. I have the razor. I, and I, you know, I probably should recycle them and do whatever you're supposed to do with them. But, but, uh, um, but it just that drawer reminds me of the futility of a material world. And eventually, eventually, every one of us, uh, either, either you've, you, uh, if you're in the Bay Area, you probably did not move into a new home. And the, and the home that you're living in is probably not the ideal home you'd like to live in. But, one, but there was a day when the home that you're in now was brand new and cutting edge. And if you, if you, by God's grace, have been able to move into a brand new cutting edge home, just wait five years, it will no longer be cutting edge. And, it, and, and that, is the, that is the state of the material world that we live in. Now, the reason I, I, I bring this up, I didn't want to just kind of say, hey, let's think about the past, is we're going through um, a message that Jesus gave. He happened to, it says that he sat down on the side of a mountain and gave this message. And so we got really creative and we call it the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, what is Jesus teaching here? And he begins to address this material world that we live in. But, but the big, I want you to understand the big picture before we get there. The big picture is he's really talking, it might sound like a new religion, but he's, what he's really talking about is a true or real, if you would, religion. This is what it really is. We, we had made it about um, forms and functions and rules, and Jesus kind of just undercuts all that and says, you, you've missed it. Last week, case in point, he talked about the fact that true religion is really about trust, not religious activity. And he, so he picked three of the, remember, he picked three of the great um, things, religious activities of the day, prayer, giving to the poor, and fasting, going without food in order to focus on God. And he said, if you do all those things in front of others, that's your reward. Ultimately, do you trust God to do those things in private when no one else sees? Is it really about God or is it really just about? And if you do that, you'll get your reward. Now, most of that had to talk with the, those people who are truly religious. But Jesus then goes into, he's still talking about reward. He's still talking about trust. But he kind of wants to make sure to get everybody. And that's where we pick up in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. If you have a Bible, you might want to open it up. It'll be on the screen. You can also take a uh, look at the Bible ahead of you. And one of the reasons we do this is because I have a lot to say today, but I, I, I want 
be clear that we're not talking about what the pastor talks about. I want, I want, this really is about what Jesus said. That's our desire is to really know and believe what Jesus said, not just some religion. So picking up in verse 19, um, Jesus says this. He says to the crowd, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye, he says, is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one, he says, can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, a simple outline of, of what we just read is, is Jesus basically says, do not store it for yourselves treasure in, on earth, but store it for yourselves treasure in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Everything else is kind of fill in the blanks, but that is the general idea. Do not do this, do do this, and this is why. In the, in the do not section, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, he gives us my, a better example of my lame cell phone example. In that day and age, uh, they didn't have a lot of modern things that we have, and so clothes often got ruined by moss. Uh, the metals often were destroyed by rust. I guess that's still true today. And, um, and even if your possessions missed not uh, being moth-eaten or rust, they're Thieves break in and steal. And his point is, is pretty simple. When you invest in a house, when you invest in a phone, when you invest in whatever, the latest and greatest, clothes, uh, vacations, um, it all eventually gets old. See, the material world all lives, functions by the second law of thermodynamics. For some of you, it's been a while, maybe, since you heard about the second law of thermodynamics. And I probably couldn't give you a good scientific explanation if I had to. But let me give you the layman's explanation. Everything, everything is losing energy on its own and is going to disorder and decay. Everything. You, the universe, the earth, everything. Everything is moving to, if you would, Stillness, death. That's the second law of thermodynamics. And what he says, and what, that's what he basically says is, if you invest your treasure, and you can think of your money, but I would say in the Bay Area, your time might be worth more than your money. Your talents may be worth more than your money. But whatever your treasure is, he says, if you invest your treasure in anything that the second law of thermodynamics affects, my words, not his, um, eventually it'll come to nothing. Eventually it'll end up in a drawer. And the truth is, is even, even uh, most of the greatest lives of, of wealth, at least in the world, end up in a drawer somewhere. If I was to give you, I looked up the, the you know, top t richest people of all time. Most of them you would not even recognize. And by the way, Bill Gates doesn't even break the top ten. You don't remember their names. Or they are a footnote. They literally are an answer to a multiple question answer in a history book. But we don't give it a second thought. On the other hand, he says, store it for your treasures in heaven. Because this is what we know about heaven. Uh, moth can't get there. Rust can't get there. Thieves can't get there. It is, if you would... Um, the Bitcoin of investments. It is the life lock of where you should uh, keep things. 
because thieves cannot get in and cannot be destroyed. It is a smart investment. Because not only is it protected, but it's also eternal. See, uh, um, hopefully you've, everyone here, no matter whether you're young or old, has thought about, if you would, investing in the future, especially retirement. And there's this, there's this dance we do when we look at retirement, and the dance is this. You try to think when you're going to stop working, and then you try to guess when you're going to die. <laughs> And then you say, okay, from the time I stop working to the time that I'm going to die, that's so many years, and this is how much money it's going to take for me to live those many years. And you just hope and you just pray that you guess right. First of all, that you make it there in the first place, no guarantee. And second of all, when you do make it, that you didn't underestimate how much you're going to live, or maybe that you didn't waste so many years trying to save for 20 and you only got to enjoy three. But when he says, think about heaven, when he's saying it, there is, there is an eternal investment where you never outlive your investment. And better yet, your portfolio never goes down. <laughs> Ever. Ever. Now, there, there is, you know, um, a lot of times people come to me and say, yeah, Joel, that's great, but you know, we should really serve God just because we love him for no other reason. And to a certain degree, I agree with you. That's absolutely true. And ultimately, this is going to come down to trust in our relationship with God. But I do, want to, I do want to point out that Jesus talks about reward. That's the context. This all comes out of verse 1. He says, store up because that's where the reward, that's where you're going to get the best, if you would, bang for your buck. Paul talks, Paul talks about, you might want to put in the margin of your thing, you can look this up later, 2 Corinthians 5.10, 2 Corinthians 5.10, where he says, we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and we will give account for the things that we've done in this life. Or write down 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, 1 Corinthians 3, 11, <coughs> excuse me, through 15, where he says, the works that we've done will be tested as with fire. If, if, our, if our works were really selfish and eternal and our, it was worldly treasure, it'll burn up. But if it's eternal treasure, it will last. And God would give a reward. And, and Paul actually says, therefore, do your task and do it well. Now, there's an initial judgment. That is whether you get into glory. That exclusively has to do with did you trust God enough for your salvation through Christ. But there is a second standing before God. We, I don't understand how this works. The Bible, he doesn't, he doesn't specify if it, if it you know, relates to a mansion, if it relates to you know, your free time in heaven. It doesn't really say, but what it does say is you will be rewarded for the investment that you made in this lifetime. Believers should focus on God's purpose, God's goals, and God's plan. Now, Jesus doesn't say we need not lose our riches but our riches need to change their place. We need to make sure that possessions don't possess us. That possessions don't possess us. Let me, let me give you this uh, example. Um, we, our kids entered the 21st century, at least in their mind's eye, this last Christmas, and they all went from flip phones to smartphones. Now, none of it is the really nice ones, but to them... Any smartphone is less embarrassing than what they had. <laughs> and so they were all extremely happy about their phones and, and what it means for their social status. And yet, invariably, I will walk in their room and their phone, new, brand new smartphone, will be laying on their floor. And I will usually kindly, sometimes not, remind them that if they cherish this, it's a really not a smart thing to leave your phone on the ground. You forget people walking in, you can't, and then you can't blame them. And I tell them to, to get your phone off the ground and put it up on a dresser. And in essence, in essence Christ is, Jesus here is advising you and me to raise our riches from the earth to heaven. He says, I'm a, I, I, w I want you to have reward. 
I just suggest that your best investments are raised from the earth where whatever you invest in here will be gone eventually. If you don't squander it away, your children will. Or their children will. Because those who don't earn it, who just get it, always squander it. Just look at the world. And eventually it all comes to naught. And so raise your riches is what Jesus, raise your investment. And then he says, now here's the purpose. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, this really isn't about money. It really isn't about your time and talents. It is about your heart. The heart refers to your mind, your emotions, and will. See, Jesus' point here is, listen, you know, I was saying in this, in this earlier passage, when I talked about prayer, when I talked about um, um, fasting, when I talked about giving to the poor, I said, really, the issue is about trust. And you might be saying to yourself, how do I know whether or not I really trust God? And Jesus says, I got a barometer. You know, a barometer measures, right? I got, I got a measuring stick for you. Now, now, ideally, the measuring stick is your heart, but you want to know, how do I measure the heart? It's not like I can pull it out. And How do I measure whether or not he says, easy. Maybe not so easy. Where's your treasure? Where's your treasure? Because where your treasure is shows you what controls you. Where your treasure is shows you what you value. Where your treasure is actually shows you what you love, what you desire, where your treasure is. And then he gives two examples to, so, to kind of make this clear. First of all, he talks about our eyes, your eyes. Here, the eyes are the expression of the soul, not its intake necessarily, although certainly the two ideas are related. But what Jesus stresses is that the good eye acts in a healthy way. It's light. It is a sign of the healthy soul. But the bad eye reflects darkness. In other words, your focus reveals your heart. It really is about what are you looking at? Where do you find yourself pursuing? Now, many of you know that um, I have a motorcycle, and I love to ride my motorcycle. And there's, this is probably true of driving, period, but it's especially true with a motorcycle. Your bike will go where your eyes are. You can afford to kind of wander off a little bit more in a car than you can in a motorcycle. And there's this interesting thing, especially in a turn. When you're turning, you don't look down. You don't look to the left or right. You look about 40 feet or so ahead of you. And the interesting thing is in the turn, if you look ahead, your bike will go where your eyes are going, where your eyes are looking. That is where you will go. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. He says if the focus of your eyes, the focus of your attention is on possessions, is, is on um, romance novels, is on um, your bank account, is on entertainment. That reflects your soul. That affects what you treasure. But if your eyes are on good things, if your eyes are on the things of God, that reflects your soul. And that is where you will go. Where is your focus? Where is your focus? And here, it's simple. You don't get to do this because you probably, like me, we're really good at self-deceiving our, ourselves. So I might say, well, you know, basically my eyes are, you know, where I, my focus is great. Here's the test. Without saying anything, if you handed somebody your bank statement and said, based on what you see here, my fo what is my focus? If you handed somebody your calendar, the real one, not the one of I would like to do this, but the real daily, what you really did do in a week. You hand them in your calendar, what would they say your focus of your life is? If we were to, if we were, we were to map out, if we were able to map out, you know, when you daydream, when you can actually control your dreams, we can be able to see that, we could lay that out, what would that reveal about your focus? What would your Google search reveal about your focus. Because that shows where your heart is. The second example he gives is, the, is about your master. Either, either he uses this word mammon, 
It's, it's, that's where we, we get this word. It's a transliteration of, the, of an Aramaic word, which means wealth or property. But the root of this word actually means, both in Hebrew and Aramaic, indicates some place that you put confidence in. And so he's saying, there, in essence, he, he, he makes this confidence and he, he personifies it. And he says, either your confidence is in this master or your, or your confidence is in God. And he pits the two together. Now, in our context, this is easy to miss because in our context, we're employed. We don't have masters. They might feel like one, but you're employed, which means you can have two or three or more employers. Right? You work out with so many hours here, then you work so many hours there, and then maybe you go home and work so many hours there. But in this day and time, it wasn't quite like the slavery that we're familiar with in, in America, but you, you became a bond servant of someone else. It was a financial agreement where they took care of you, you served them, but they had absolute authority. They were your master. You could not have two masters. Because the very fact that a master means their word wins 100% of the time. And what Jesus is saying here is if you want to know where your treasure is or your heart will be also, you can only have one thing that's telling you the way it is and what you should do. Only one person can you have confidence in. And if your confidence is in your bank account, if your confidence is in your ability, if your conf confidence lies in how you entertain and take care of yourself, then it, in contrast, God can't be the one you're confident in. It doesn't work both ways. It's one or the other. By the way, Jesus' word's not mine. Okay? If you, need, if you want to argue about this, you've got to argue with him. Each demands that we're single-mindedly focused. Now, I, 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 just, I just really quickly I want to say, he's not talking about it's bad to save. Proverbs actually says a wise person saves. He's not talking about you shouldn't have possessions, right? Because we're supposed to provide for uh, our relatives. We're supposed to be generous with others. Uh, in Timothy, uh, Paul even says that to, to tell those who have been blessed to enjoy what they have. What he's talking about here is the accumulation just for the sake of accumulation. What he's talking about here is the confidence in, a selfishness, a self-centeredness, a reliance upon. Do not. Do not put your treasure there, but instead put it in eternity. Why? Because your heart matters. And that, by the way, is what God's going to measure. Don't miss that. See, when you stand in glory, God's, God's little reward thing, God's even entry plan isn't how much church did you go to. I know that's weird for a pastor to say, but that's not what he's going to measure. How much Bible did you know? How pious were you? How much did you give to? No, his, his ultimate question is, did you trust me? Was I your, not only your savior, but your Lord, master. Now, those other things may be an indicator that he is, but ultimately that's not what's measured. It's your trust and love of him that is measured. That is the barometer. Now, Jesus knows the heart of men and women like, like me. So he knows what I'm instantly going to begin to think. First of all, I'm going to say, amen, Jesus. But then my second thought's going to be, now, wait a second. Uh, who's going to take care of me then? Because I've, I've been taught from, from my youngest years, even from my Christian parents, though it's not spoken out, out loud, sometimes it is, especially by the media and by my school and by my peers, right? If I don't look out for me, who nobody else will. I, I, I've been taught, you know, it, it is my job to make sure that my life works, that I need to plan, that I need to, I need to, I need to, I need to. And Jesus says, don't worry about that. Worry about my stuff. And so the result is, I worry. <laughs> and so Jesus goes on, starting in verse 25 here. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Oh, he's going to address that. Okay. 
He says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life more important, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? Who of you by worrying could add a single hour to your life? That's worth meditating on some. Verse 28, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, he was, by the way, he was the richest man in all of time. You know, I'm telling you, not only Solomon, all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown to the fire, will he not much more clothe you? And then he says, oh, Joel, that's probably not in your translation. <laughs> oh, you of little faith, because he knows I'm worrying. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, the unreligious, those who aren't following God, run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But instead, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. So he starts with this idea, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. And then again, he'll end this section with, but instead seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. It's the same formula as, as what we just went over. Don't do that, but do do this. And so first he addresses the worry part. Do not worry about your life. And he and mentions three things. He mentions um, life is more than eating, it's more than drinking, it's more than clothes. Now notice here that the, this section is really talking about the necessities of life. These are the things that you need. You could add under clothes to shelter. We need food. We can't live without food. We can't live without drink. Um, we can't live without um, clothes or shelter. Those are the necessities of life. And so, and, and, and he, remember, he is talking to a crowd um, that is, is what we would consider dirt poor. See, there is, there's no middle class. For most of the time, and actually most of the world today, there is no middle class. It's a modern phenomenon. There was just the one percenters and then everybody else who pretty much just lived hand to mouth. And they were poor. I mean, you, you may think you live in the Bay Area, you live in hand to mouth, but no. No. No, if, if you have a job and you're living in the Bay Area, you are a one percenter in the world today. You are a one percenter. As a matter of fact, if we were to add up all of time, those folks in our, in our country who are living on the streets are in the 1%. I, I, it's hard for us to imagine. And I'm not undermining what they're going through because it is hard. That, that's not my point. My, my point is, is that we are extremely blessed. And what Jesus is saying here is, is, is why are you worrying about these things? And then he, and then he so that look, worry means paying attention to what we cannot change instead of putting our energies and work in the things that we can into effective ways. That, in essence, is what he's talking about worrying. And then he gives us some examples. And he's going to talk about birds. He's going to talk about flowers. He's going to talk about the unreligious. But here's the conclusion of, of each of these. And don't miss this. His point is this. God provides in each of these cases. And in each of these cases, these things are pretty insignificant. But you, you know what? You're pretty important to dad. Because he's not just dad, he's daddy. And you're his favorite child. So if he takes care of these, that he's not that big a deal to him, how much more is he going to take care of you? So he talks about the birds. Now, the birds do work, by the way. They don't just sit there and the food drop into the nest. <laughs> Okay, they, they go out and do something. That, his point here is don't you know, go out and work. Don't try to do anything. His point is don't worry. And he says, as they're going about, if the father makes sure that the birds have food. And if he's going to do that for a bird, 
Don't you think you're much more valuable than a bird? And the answer is yes. Not just little yes, yeah. He says, consider the, the flowers and the, and the field. Look how beautiful they are. I mean, even that really rich guy, Solomon, didn't really clothe, be clothed as beautiful as the flowers, but the flowers, they show up when it rains, and they're gone when it's dry. And if God spends all his time and energy to make them look, how much more is he going to provide for you? Why? Because you're his kid. And he says, look at those people who don't even love God. He uses the word pagan or, or Gentile or however you want to say it. There's the people who, who are far from God. Don't they eat? Yes. Don't they have clothes? Yes. Doesn't God seem to send rain on their crops? Yes. Doesn't God seem to bless them? Yes. Well, if God allows them to be blessed and they're not even his kid, how much more is he going to take care of you, his kid? How much more? See, the question is, do you trust your daddy? That's the bottom line here. If you're worrying, it's because you, you forget who you belong to. And you forget who your father is. Now, I understand here. I just, I'm going to take a half a step back and say, I understand some of us have really bad earthly parents. And so this whole idea of daddy providing for you and showing you favor isn't resonating with you. I get that. But do not judge God through the lens of your earthly parents, even, by the way, if you had good ones. Because when we talk about love, we don't, we don't describe God as being loving God is love, is, is love. He doesn't love, he is love. All he knows is blessing and goodness. And he loves to take care of his kids. Now, just like my kids and me, but better, God's version of taking care of us is different than then, or my version of taking care of my kids is different than their version of me taking care of them, right? In their, in their version, right, we always have dessert before any meal. We never have vegetables. They get anything they want, right? They, ha they have the latest iPhone and all, you know, which obviously we know that when we're caring for them. But here's the thing. There are things in our lives that you and me and I definitely talk about me. I'm convinced that if God really cared about me, he'd give me this. Contrary to all evidence in Scripture that says, no, that's not necessarily true. That's not necessarily true. Do you trust the Father? In other words, are, are we willing to spend less time worrying about our bank accounts and more time serving the church? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Are we, are, we, are we ready to spend less time worrying about mortgages and more time visiting the sick? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Are, are, we, are we willing to spend less time worrying about college tuition payments, something I'm beginning to worry about? I'm just confessing. And more time serving God's people, hearing how much God loves me in his word. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Because when you seek first daddy's kingdom, when you seek first daddy's ways, he says, these things that you worry about will be added to you. These things that you can't control will be added to you. The question is, where are your eyes? Who do you trust? Where is your confidence? If it's in God, there is big blessing. But if it's elsewhere... There is darkness. Because everywhere else we put our eyes, everywhere else we put our, our, our energy, ultimately will give way to the second law of thermodynamics. It will come to dis disorder and death. Every time. 100% of the time. So here's my question for you and I. Where is our focus? Where is your heart? Where is it? Do you, do you trust Daddy? Or have you misguidedly put that trust somewhere else? I challenge you to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where your focus is. Honestly. 
And then, and then I encourage you to take one step. Now, I, I, I gotta, do not approach this the way we usually approach our New Year's resolutions, okay? I don't know about you, but, but especially in my early years, my New Year's resolution was this. I thought of the 10 things in my life that need to improve. And I decided that on January 1, all those things were going to change. And I was going to go from no exercise to an hour every day. I was going to go from barely reading my Bible to an hour every day. I was going to go from... And then, of course, first of all, I never did the math. There was never that many hours in a day. <laughs> And second of all, it just it was it wasn't. So when so when you begin to say, okay, I, I understand my eye, my focus has been here, it needs to be there. What's the one thing where you can get your eyes moved over? What's the one thing? Because this is what I heard a, a thing on the radio this week that the newer generation, millennials, or whatever you want to call them, uh, they spend more on coffee than they do in investment. Fifteen about fifteen dollars a day. I know. I, know, it's the, I don't know how that works out, but it's a lot of caffeine. Actually, sugar. But, <laughs> but a good investor will say, listen, if you just took your coffee money, I mean, if it is $15 a day, and you in your 20s began to invest that now, it doesn't seem like a whole lot of money. But because of compound interest and, and, the, and the way that that things you know, grow, they get more expensive over in time, you will, you will do really well when you retire. And what I'm saying is I don't know how much time. You may only have a day left. You may have a year left. You may have 10, 20, 30, 50. I don't know. But what I would tell you this. Rather than worrying about the totality of it, look at today. Not tomorrow. He said, don't worry about tomorrow, right? It'll take care of itself. Look at today and say, what's the one little thing I can invest in today that can change my focus from this to God's kingdom and invest in that thing today? And the amazing thing is that when you then enter in eternity, you might not think I did a whole lot. But a lifetime of just shifting our focus, of just choosing a different master in little ways and sometimes larger ways adds up to, well, done, good, and faithful servant. Well done. Because it's not about the totality, it's about the heart and the willingness just to take one step at a time. Please do not let this message just be whatever it is at this moment. This, this is one to make an appointment with yourself. This is one to take someone out to lunch and, and process a little bit. Maybe go through these four questions in, your, in the handout here and see where the Lord takes you.